seen and despair like the sea waves cold threaten the soul with infinite loss grace that is greater yes grace untold points to the refuge of mighty Good morning and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. I want to welcome you to Menton Seventh-day Adventist Church in sunny Southern California. Well, praise the Lord for the rain, huh? This morning I want to welcome you with a fantastic piece of scripture. It's found in Titus 2.11. And it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. May the Lord bless us as we worship him. Good morning. You're wondering who this person in the bright shirt and suspenders is standing before you. My name is Rob Rainey, and I'm with Child Impact International. This afternoon at 2.15, I'd like to invite you to come back, uh, stay by after the potluck dinner, and listen to a um, presentation that I have to give to you. When I was a child, I loved 13th Sabbath because that's when we got to have Mission Spotlight. I thought it'd be wonderful one day to be a missionary. But as I grew, I went to college, got married, began to amass debt, and never made it out of the States to be a missionary. I did go off to the wilds of New Jersey once to be a task force worker, so that's as far as I got to being a, a real life missionary. Until I began my work with Child Impact International. This afternoon at 2.15, I'd like to share with you what you can do to be a missionary even if you stay at home even while you're at home, how you can be a missionary. I understand this is a very active, mission-oriented church. Amen. I visited with Dr. Uh, Patel earlier this week, and he said, I mentioned to him that I was going to be speaking last night at the, uh, the villa over in Loma Linda, and he got on the phone and made a phone call, and here I stand before you two days later. So it's his fault I'm here, but praise God that I'm here, and I would like to share with you this afternoon at 2.15, uh, stay by and hear about how you can be a missionary in Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, and now Papua New Guinea as well with Child Impact International. Thank you, Rob. Morning and welcome, everyone. Uh, whether you are in our sanctuary worshiping with us or watching us online or perhaps LLBN, the His Light channel, uh, we want to welcome you and pray that you'll receive a blessing from the service today. Part of that blessing is these beautiful flowers that are contributed by Jeej, our sister Jeej Betcher, 
uh, in honor of her birthday. And I want to uh, remind you or alert you that there is a calendar out in the foyer. And if there is a special event, a birthday, a graduation, an anniversary, whatever it might be, that you would like to recognize uh, with a special gift, please sign the uh, date on that calendar out there. And uh, you can talk to my wife uh, or um, Marilyn Holloway as far as uh, other details concerning it. But uh, uh, we would love to have your gift of flowers. And then, of course, you can take them home after church. I will uh, let you know that there are many other announcements in the bulletin that I will be happy for you to read on your own so we don't take valuable time away. But again, we want to welcome you and uh, pray for God's blessing to rest upon us as we worship him today. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. I have uh, one short announcement about this evening. We are beginning our conversation as a follow-up from the uh, parent assessment that we did in November and December of last year, uh, for specifically for the age groups of junior high and the high schoolers. So tonight at 5 p.m. here in the fellowship hall, we are going to begin our conversation. Uh, we don't know what to call it yet, hence you may have seen it in an email or in the bulletin that says Youth and Family Worship Night. That's as far as we got so far. So we want to in extend our invitation to you, especially for those uh, parents um, of early teens and high schoolers, specific of that two age, those two age groups. Uh, we're going to be talking about topics relevant, especially to their needs. So we invite you, but not just if parents, this is not a drop off. We invite you to stay with us as well as we continue on this conversation. And I believe, June, you have one other announcement as well. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Uh, I would just like to announce the Adventist Youth Program that we're going to have uh, next Sabbath, 530. Uh, we didn't have one December because of all the activities that we had and, of course, the other program that we're going to talk about. But we invite you to come, um, youth, young people, their families, and all, everyone who wants to be blessed by the message of God through the young people, please come here at 5.30 uh, next Sabbath. Also, uh, I'd just like to in further encourage you, Pastor Anderson has always mentioned it ever since he got here about our yearly uh, uh, reading of the Bible through the whole year. And I've been talking to a lot of people. They've been uh, uh, very um, uh, diligent and um, uh, very uh, um, faithful with regards to reading their Bible through uh, for this year, please kindly continue. And uh, if you still uh, want to catch up, I think there's still time. You could read the Bible uh, until, this, un until the uh, end of this year. And, and, and I could say personally, it's always, it's been a blessing uh, reading through the Bible, uh, aside from uh, other, uh, reading the Bible in, in my devotional time. And um, I, I'm saying that because... Uh, I'm going to call on Sister Season uh, and uh, brother, uh, Pastor Gatra again about uh, what uh, motivated me also to go through uh, reading of the Bible because of this event that happened just a few weeks ago. So at this time, we want to um, do a little a highlight and report of what happened two weeks ago, as Juna mentioned. Um, two weeks ago, or just a few days before the New Year, um, most of you have heard of about this, but we had GYC in Phoenix uh, from December 27 to 31. How many of you are unfamiliar what GYC is? Oh, there's a couple hands, but that's okay. Uh, GYC stands for Generation of Youth for Christ, uh, which is a movement that exists to help ready the young people to meet their Lord. And But it's also a movement that... Um, uh, not just limited to the young people, but also to, for those who are interested, young at heart, uh, to be able to come to the conference and be inspired. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite uh, Brother June and C uh, Sister Season to come up. I do have some pictures I want, we want to show you. Um, check. If you can show the first photo here. Um, this is the... This is the early uh, uh, United Prayer that we would have every morning. Uh, and you, you would see, I think the peak, of, peak numbers that we have is like more than 1,000. Coming in at around 6, um, 6 o'clock. 6 a.m. Just for prayer. Just for United prayer. prayer. And uh, it's been a blessing, and I could uh, attest to uh, uh, the miracles that have happened to it uh, because of it. 
And, uh, I, I, and it's amazing if we, this could be duplicated everywhere. Amen. Could you go to, to the next slide? I'm just going to scroll through. This, um, June, you want to say something about this picture? Yes. I, I think we ha- we, we're, <laughs> we're the church which, ha- which has one of the biggest group. It helps that Phoenix is the closest uh, GYC that we've ever had. Actually, we started uh, the pictures with only a few family, but they keep on coming. And so we, we, we had to get this last big picture. Uh, this is just after the Sabbath um, morning meeting. And uh, the title of the, of the theme of the whole meeting was Arise, based on Isaiah 61. So it's been a blessing uh, to all of us who came there. And this is the, uh, the bus ride to our uh, outreach in, in the afternoon. Uh, we reach out to the communities of Phoenix to share with them uh, the gospel truth and those who are maybe interested in Bible studies. And I think we approximately have 700 plus Bible interests sign up just because of that effort. And this is us before we uh, went to the bus ride. Uh, we also have, we were blessed with uh, special music. This is one of uh, that uh, special music that we were, uh, with, that we listened to. You may recognize Daniel Cerna there right in the middle to the right. And I, I don't have the picture pro day of Pastor Gatra was there with uh, a lot of our. Uh, That's okay. You can catch it on 3ABN. Okay. This is a. Uh, this is, uh, of course, it's not all about uh, preaching. There's also the physical uh, nourishment that we received that, uh, that, and good fellowship that we had there. This is uh, one of the vegan restaurants, Thai restaurants in, uh, nearby the convention center. And, and then you, we met you may recognize old, this face. Yeah, we met an old friend there. He's still uh, young there, uh, Pastor Kyle. All right. So I, I have a question for you guys. Um, can you tell us a little bit, the, just your highlight perhaps from... GYC. Uh, just a little bit before um, uh, I turn it to uh, Sister Season. It's it's my first GYC. I've been. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I've always uh, wanted to go to GYC, but uh, I thank God that it's Phoenix. I, although they had Phoenix a couple of years ago, but this is the first time that I was able to take time off and and bring um, my family. Uh, it's more than the the blessing is more than I ever expected or even imagined. Just if 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 you want to be uh, closer to God uh, within His presence, within His people. Uh, always take that opportunity. Never, if you can, uh, through God's help, never uh, um, skip on that opportunity uh, because uh, opportunities like this don't happen often. And if we could take a hold of it, we, it's, it's an, immor- an enormous blessing. Praise God. What about you, Season? Uh, what, what, would you, what would you say as your highlight was from GYC? My highlight. Okay, so... Um, GYC, the neat part about coming together is you'll have to, I was thinking of this, um, if I just may say, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, it says, and let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of such is, but so much the more as we see the day approaching. Beautiful thing about coming together as a church. It's one thing um, to hear a recording on audio verse, to see it church online if you can't make it there, but to be together with God's people, worshiping together, praying together, studying the Bible together, singing together, the spirit just really moves. It's a very moving experience. It's a very real experience. And at GYC, they have plenary sessions in the huge auditorium. Everybody comes together in the morning, and then there's breakout sessions all throughout the day, and you come together again in the evening. And one of the ones that really stuck out to me was Sabbath morning before Sabbath school and church started. Renella, Renella is her name, uh, Pastor Kyle's girlfriend. She spoke this powerful message about what Jesus' mission was, what um, our mission is, the distractions that keep us from focusing on our message. So if I may just highlight really quick. Jesus was raised um, on his mother's knee um, learning the scriptures. And he read the scriptures himself. That's where he learned what his mission was. He goes to Jerusalem to the assembling to themselves together of everybody. He sees the sacrificial system. And he goes aside to ponder these things to realize this is what I was, this is what I came to this world for. This is what I was made for. This is my mission. And and there was a there was just something also to parents to not underestimate the ability of your children to perceive spiritual things at a very young age and to begin to understand what their mission is in life. And then the distractions that come and that um, are, are, you know, get in front of us to, uh, to just distract us 
um, from the focus of our mission. And she was very forward in saying, you know, get rid of it, cut it off. And then if you still don't know what your mission is, you don't know what you're doing here yet, your mission is found in the scriptures, and that's where you find it. Revelation 14 is our mission. We are made, our mission is to prepare a people for the second coming of the Lord and to get rid of the distractions, and this is what we are here for. It was very, it was very moving. And I don't know if you have another question. Yes, I do. Well, I, I, want, I want to tell you, uh, share with you my highlight. My highlight was actually um, the, 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 very, the various small groups that they had. There were so many selections, it just so happened to be uh, the one that I particularly wanted to. I, I had been praying um, about this before I went, uh, before we went on, on our Christmas vacation. Uh, we flew straight into uh, Phoenix to meet with the rest of the crowd at GYC. But I, it, GYC in many ways answered this prayer. I was sitting in the, uh, the, the seminar that was entitled, um, it, it's an uh, emphasis on the social media, but rather it, the, the title was um, Stealing Lucifer's playground. Um, how do we really do um, well to do a ministry with social media rather than to be distracted in the things? Um, that will be kind of that provides a, um, a conversation uh, that will later on to be uh, announced again at Mentone here. We're going to, I'm, I'm excited for it because that was a, a source of networking for me. God answered my prayer in that sense because I wasn't sure what to do with in that regard for the needs of our church. But God just answered it at UIC. Um, the next question I want to ask you uh, guys is, um, so if there is one thing, if you were to boil it down, if you were to make an appeal to our church here, to our congregation, what would it be as, as far as uh, in regards to UIC? Um, I, I think I, I'm, I said it already, but I'm going to just emphasize. And also Season mentioned that. Never forsake the assembling of, of God's people. Uh, the church, in worship at home, and in this uh, 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 conference, if you have that opportunity, please do come because the Holy Spirit is being poured out in a special way. So if, um, if, God, if it's God's will for you to come, please go because you will be blessed uh, uh, in so many ways. And if I may say in closing also that everything of value has a sacrifice. So my appeal to you would be to sacrifice to go to a GYC in person. Sacrifice the time to take off work, even if it's without pay. Sacrifice the traveling um, funds to go, the expenses to go. Sacrifice your hard-earned money to support a youth or many young people to attend the next GYC. It's going to be in Houston, Texas at the end of this year. And um, GYC really is all about sacrifice, assembling yourselves together, commitment, prayer, leave changed, and go make a difference. Amen. Amen. I think you put it so well there, uh, Season. Uh, just to put it out there, for those of you who don't know, Season has, how many children do you have? I have four small children under the age of five. Four children. What a testament it is for us, right? You're never too late, never too young to go to GYC. So uh, it is our hope and prayer that we hope to see all of you there next year in, uh, or this, at the end of this year in Houston. Shall we have the invocation now? Heavenly Father, through the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ and through his sacrifice, we come before your throne of grace. We thank you for the many, many, many blessings that you have bestowed upon each one of us. Please continue to bless us and help us to get closer and closer to you. Bless our worship service and may it be acceptable in thy sight this morning. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's stand now for our opening hymn, number 423. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken, formed thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded, what can shake our shoes? 
Be seated. Now is the time to worship the Lord through our giving. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, gracious Lord, creator of all things, everything belongs to you in the entire universe. We belong to you too, Lord, whether we want to accept it or not. Our hearts are beating at this very moment because you exist and because you gave us life and because you love us. And because of Jesus who died on the cross, help us to be mindful of that, that a very, very extremely expensive price was paid for our lives, the ultimate sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us, and we pray at this time that through our giving, many other souls will come to know you to love you and to serve you. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
Now it's time for the children's story. You can sit here, children. Brother Logan's got the children's story. As they, the children come forward, they will collect the lamb's offering for the Nehemiah's project. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. How many? 
many of you like seeds? Anybody like seeds? <laughs> I've always liked to collect seeds. And I've got oh, a few boxes of seeds. Not really big boxes, but seeds at home. And I brought a few of them with me. Uh, one seed I do not have in my collection, though, is the largest kind of seed in the world. What are the largest seeds? Anyone know what are the largest seeds? Mangoes. Mangoes have big seeds, yes. Well, coconuts? Coconuts are the largest seeds I know of. In fact, they are the largest seeds. In fact, there's a particular kind of coconut. Um, behind you, there's a picture of the coconut. This is the largest type of coconut in the world. I think the name of the coconut's on the next slide. And there we have it. There's the seed that's inside. The, the coconut seed is inside what you see in this picture here. Here it is. This is the largest coconut in the world. And the largest one that's been measured was 12 inches, one foot, okay? One foot in length, and it weighed 40 pounds. Anybody here four years old? How many, anyone here four? You're five, okay? You may remember being four, right? Okay. People who are four generally are approximately 40 pounds, okay? So that's a seed as big as a four-year-old. Okay, 50 pounds, all right. Okay, so there we go. So the largest coconut seed was 40 pounds. Well, a big seed like that should make a pretty big tree, right? Yeah, okay, a big seed like that should make a pretty big tree, and, it, and they do. Um, in fact, the largest, this is a coconut tree from, this, from one of these seeds. Um, this one's, I'm sure, not the biggest one. But the biggest coconut tree was 186 feet. Okay, that's much taller than this church. Okay, 186, 186 feet. Okay, now I've got another seed to show you. I don't have an actual one of these seeds. Actually, we ordered... Um, some of these seeds a week ago, but they haven't come yet. But I have, but I have one that looks like it. Okay, here's a picture. All right. This is. This actually is an oatmeal, a, a seed of oatmeal. Okay, a rolled oat. Okay, but that's about what what this one looks like. Okay, that's not a rolled oat. This is another kind of seed. All right, so a coconut, those big seeds grow into trees that are 186 feet. How big do you think one of these little seeds is going to grow into? Not that big, huh? Yeah, okay. All right, let me show you how big these get. All right. <laughs> yeah, the grizzly giant. This is a giant sequoia tree. Okay. In Mariposa Groves. My wife and I have been there. A very giant tree. General Sherman tree. This is in Sequoia National Park. Okay. Very large trees. These trees, the largest one seems to have been 311 feet. 311. Shorter than this. Okay. So you can't tell how big a tree is going to be from the size of its seed. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Okay. So, oh, here's a picture of a giant sequoia and a bunch of students from Holbrook Indian School where I taught some years ago. And uh, we're standing around the tree. My daughter is in the pink there in the front, Lily. And so that was a number of years ago when she was much smaller. And it's a giant sequoia tree. You can see how big around it is. Very giant tree. All right. Um, you know, there's some pine cones, and there you see that same seed again. All right. I've, speaking of pine cones, here's a piece of a pine cone. When I was uh, a teenager, and we lived in Redlands, not too far from here, we had a big tree in our front yard which had these huge pine cones. This is just a little piece of it. It fell into pieces, but I kept the pieces of this big pine cone tree. These pine cones were really heavy. One pine cone, I, I don't think I ever weighed it, um, but it weighs probably about 20 pounds. Okay, at least 10. Okay, at least 10 pounds. All right, if one of these were to fall on your head, 
<laughs> you, it, it would really, really hurt you really bad. Okay, so these are really, really big seeds. They, even though it's a pine tree, they pine, uh, the leaves don't look anything like a pine needle. Here's this. Okay, here's, here's one of the leaves from it. They're very spiky. Okay, and so I'll pass around some seeds. Okay. Here's, here's a seed from inside the, one of the pine cones. Okay, very. There's the seed itself, and it's inside this little case. So I'll pass around a bag that has the scales from the pine cone and the seeds, and you can take a look at that. So go ahead and take a look and pass it around. Now just keep the things inside the bag, though. Don't take them out of the bag. Try to pass them around rather quickly. All right. So. All right, there, this is so the grown-ups can see the, these things, too. Okay, the, pen, the pen's there just so you can see how big it is. Okay, all right. If you look behind you, what kind of thing do you think that is? That's a banana. What are those things inside it? Has anyone seen bananas with seeds like that inside? <laughs> all right. Yeah, the bananas you buy at the store, did it, have you seen? Yeah, okay. The bananas you buy at the store don't have big seeds like that, all right? In fact, this, is, this banana has mostly seeds inside. They have hybridized the bananas by you know, crossing them and so forth, so they don't make big seeds like that, because this is mostly seeds, not a whole lot of fruit inside. All right, these are my probably my favorite, at least one of my favorite seeds, right here. All right. Anyone know what kind of seed this is? Acorn? No, it's not an acorn. Yes. Pine cone? No, it's not a pine cone. It's a maple seed. Yes, it's a maple seed. And what I really like about the maple seeds is, watch this. You see that? They, they go like a helicopter. They're pretty neat because the wind catches them and allows them to blow really far so that they can grow other, um, grow other ones. I'll go ahead and let you pass these around too. Pass them fairly quickly. Don't look too long. And be gentle with these because these break. And again, keep the bag closed. Okay? Keep the bag closed and you can take a look at these. There we go. All right, and oh, one more type of seed. Okay. All right, here is, it, it's related to the beans. Okay, here's a pod, half of a pod. And then there's a bunch of little seeds in here, and I'm gonna pass this around. You can take a look at this. Got an interesting story about this. This is actually the, the seeds from an orchid plant. This is an orchid tree. There is an orchid tree at La Sierra University. Um, and one day I was walking by this when I was going to school and going to class. And I heard these things falling on the ground, making a lot of noise. What is that? And finally figured out that's what it was coming from. So I took one of these, I took one of these seed pods, in fact, the same one that's in that jar, and I put it in the car. I thought being in the hot trunk of the car, it would, it would explode in the car, but it didn't. And so I left it in the kitchen that night. In the middle of the night, we heard this explosion in the kitchen. What was that? And it scared us. We, got, we went and looked in the kitchen, and here are these seeds all over the floor. Okay, and that's the same one right there. Okay, all right. Now here are some really, really little seeds. Okay, I don't have these. Um, you can buy these at the store, but they're kind of expensive. But they're kind of similar to sesame seeds here, so I'm gonna pass these around. Okay, about this size, they're really little. Okay, really little seeds. And these seeds are actually mentioned in the Bible. Okay. These seeds are mentioned in the Bible. Anyone have a guess what kind of seed these are? Really little seeds mentioned in the Bible. Yes. Anyone know? Yes? Mustard seeds. 
These are mustard seeds. Very good. These are mustard seeds. We see mustard plants all over the place in the United States. We see them in California, too. They don't grow really big over here, but they can grow into these, these big um, woody bush-like things. Okay? All right. They can grow in these woody, bushy things. Um, they can be pretty big. Okay? And Jesus spoke about these. Okay. If we can quiet down, please, everybody. All right. I want to read something from the book of Matthew. Matthew 13, starting with verse 31. Okay. Okay. Shh, 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 shh. Listen, okay, Matthew 13, starting with verse 31. Another parable Jesus said to the people, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. It, it doesn't mean it's the smallest seed that exists, but it's, you know, it's the smallest seeds that uh, people planted back then, okay? And... Um, which a man took these seeds, and he sowed them in his field. And indeed, it's the least of seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Okay? So what did Jesus mean by this parable? What did he mean by this story? Here's what I think he meant. He was telling. He was telling the people these truths about the kingdom of God, about God's love for us. Okay? And Jesus only had a few followers. And some people thought, ah, this, these people follow Jesus. They're not going to amount to anything. But do you know what? The Christian church today is all around the world. Okay? We have millions, billions of people who believe in Jesus. And so let's pray for each, everybody who believes in Jesus that we will come to understand all the Bible truths and that we will see Jesus, okay? So Jesus' truth that he gives to us, he gives it to us in his word, and just like it has become a big church around the world, it also will transform our hearts, okay? And so let's pray that God will transform our hearts with his, the seed of his truth. Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your love for us and your blessings. Thank you so much for the seed of truth that you give to us in your Bible. And we pray that that seed will bear fruit in our lives of kindness and love and goodness. And we pray that we will see Jesus and we will go home with you when Jesus comes. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Have a good Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, church family. Sabbath. Today. Revelation 14, 4 and 5. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. May the Lord add a blessing to his word. Whatever possible, let us kneel before the Lord.
Loving Father in heaven, great God of the universe, creator of all things, before your throne of grace we come this morning in the precious name of Jesus and through his sacrifice. Lord, it is so wonderful to come on our knees and worship you. We pray, Lord, that we may worship you and you alone. And we pray that you will help us to stop worshiping the things of the world. The idolatry that is in our lives, Lord, please forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, and transform us. We thank you so much for Jesus and his sacrifice. The blood that was shed for each one of us that we may have forgiveness and transformation of our hearts and our minds. Lord, thy word says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So that's why we come before your throne this morning, and we ask that you will give us the mind of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be excited about the wonderful and the most the most uh, message that you have given to this church, the most important message that was ever given to mankind, the three angels' message. Lord, we pray that each one of us may dedicate our lives in such a way that we may arise and shine and be always prepared to give the three angels' message in all its love and the importance of it. Father in heaven, bless each one of us present here this morning, our families that are represented here. Bless them wherever they may be. You know the struggles. You know the pain. You know everything about us. Bless us, Lord. Help us to draw closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one that cares about us. He is the only one that loves us so much so that he died for us. Help us never to forget his sacrifice on the cross. At this time we ask that you will bless Pastor John in a special mighty way. May your message coming through his lips, Lord. Bless our hearts, our minds, transform our lives. May we be joyful in these last days and excited about the message. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen.
For the fruit upon the tree, for the birds the sing of thee, for the earth the beauty dress, Father, Mother, and the rest, for thy precious loving care, for thy bounty everywhere. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Thank you, Sister Marlene, for our children's choir. Appreciate that very much. Our study today, as you can see, is Follow the Lamb. And we're going to be putting quite a bit of information on the screen, so rather than take notes, if you just want to uh, send me an email and request the PowerPoint file, I'd be happy to send it to you. Let's bow our heads as we begin our study today. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath, for your holy word for the promises that you give to us, for the information that the Bible provides. We, provide, we thank you for bringing this church into existence to declare a special message to the world before Jesus comes. We pray that as a result of our study today, we'll understand that message and be better prepared to share it. We thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who died on the cross and is coming back soon. In his name we pray, amen. amen. I want to take you to my backyard. I think, there we go. I uh, have a peach tree back there, and if you can look closely, you can see that on that peach tree, in January, there are some very nice blossoms. I think my peach tree is confused. I think it's mixed up. It doesn't know the season or the times. Well, it's one thing for a peach tree to be mixed up about the times and seasons, but it's a much different thing for people to be mixed up about the times and seasons. This is what Paul wrote in Thessalonians. Concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. When they say peace and safety, have you heard that phrase lately? Yes. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains on a pregnant woman. Pregnant, pregnant woman. They shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a, as a thief. So we should be well aware of the times and the seasons. Is that not correct? One of the texts in the Bible that uh, came to light this week is this one in Matthew 24. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Was there a rumor of war within the last week? Absolutely, Absolutely there was. You know, in the uh, presentation in the uh, first service, uh, Patty, Sister Patty Perez was sitting there, and, and uh, she was actually in Hawaii 
And this uh, she received on her iPhone. among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Next slide. In their mouth was found no guile. They are without fault before the throne of God. Now we're going to go back and take a look. remaining enemy. And with him were 144,000. What's the significance of that number? I suggest it's built on the, on the root of 12. What's 12 in the Bible? The number of government, administration, 12 tribes, 12 disciples, 12 foundations, 12 gates, number of government. And so 12 times 12, multiplying it, cubing it, makes it 144. And if you multiply that by 1,000, you get 144,000. That's my understanding of what the significance of that number is. So, meaning that those that are the 144,000 are the ones who are supremely, in a multiplied way, loyal to God's government. And they have the Father's name, another way of saying his character, written on their foreheads, which is another way that they are sealed in their foreheads. Thank you. What does the forehead represent in the Bible? It's where you think and where you decide. So they have the Father's name written in their foreheads. I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters. Whose voice is that? That's Jesus. And like the voice of loud thunder. Next slide, please. I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. Uh, back. 
apologize, we're having a little technical difficulty today. I heard the sound of harpists playing with their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. No one can learn that song except the song of the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. I think we went back too many, actually. Can we go, uh, can we go forward, please? The shepherd, first time in the Bible God is referred to as shepherd, the stone of Israel. David sang, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, makes me to lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. And then in the atheist psalm, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. Next. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. And Paul said in Hebrews, now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep. Peter said, you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Next. So the concept of following God or following Jesus is all throughout the Bible, from the beginning to the end. This is what we might call the general way, the, the part that applies to everybody in that phrase, these are they which follow the Lamb. And continuing that idea, we read from Job, my foot has held fast to his steps, I have kept his way and not turned aside. Psalm 17, uphold my steps in your paths that my, my footsteps may not slip. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. So again, the idea of following the Lord applies to all people everywhere at all times. Next. Two of my favorite texts in the Bible. Psalm 85, righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. Isn't that a beautiful expression? Make his footsteps. You can get a picture in your mind of somebody walking and leaving tracks, and now you're following behind, walking in their footsteps. <coughs> and this one in Peter. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, there's the word, that you should follow his steps. Next slide, I want to take a little bit closer work at that, look at that word. Um, in Greek, it would be hypogramos. This word is made up of two parts. There's a prefix, I'll say in English, hypo, 
And what does that signify? We have a lot of words in English that have that prefix. Hypoglycemia, hypodermic, hypothermia, and all. What does hypo mean? It means under. Earlier in this week, a very skillful nurse put a needle under my skin, a hypodermic. She did so skillfully, I hardly felt it. Anyway, hypo is under. And gramos has to do with anything that's written. Words in English that uh, bear that out, telegram, hologram, and so on. So the question is, how did the compound word, writing under, how did that become the word for example? Well, next slide. We'll take a look. The word came from the practice of Greek school children writing their letters. What are the first, first two letters in the Greek alphabet? Alpha and beta. What English word do we get out of that? Alphabet. So they wrote their A's and their B's underneath the teacher's sample. Here's the teacher writing on the chalkboard or whatever they had. He's writing the sample, and underneath it, they are writing the copy. They are copying the letters. So that word, hypogromos, writing under, came to mean example in any context. But Peter is using it as, as pertaining to us following Christ's example. We are writing under and copying under copying the character of Jesus. Next slide, please.
the poor. We're not going to take a long time this morning to review that, but just be reminded that that all had to do with the prophecy of Daniel 8.14 that pinpointed the year 1844 as being when Jesus would begin that ministry in heaven. Now, there are so many wonderful things that are brought to light by this teaching. Just think about it. This teaching reveals a God of love who is fair and just. That was Satan's first charge against him. God, you're not fair. You're not transparent. Your law can't be kept. This teaching reveals the opposite. It tells us that one day his name will be vindicated. Satan has been piling smudges on the reputation of God. The cleansing of the sanctuary is going to remove every one of them, totally spotless. It reveals that God is willing to go the second mile to give evidence of his justice, to give each case a second look before the decision is rendered. God knows from the very beginning what our heart is and whether we're going to be saved or not. But the angels can't read minds. Angels can't read minds. So before he brings people to heaven, the Lord is going to open to the view of the angels what he already knows to be true. He wants the angels to be comfortable in that. That's the kind of God that he is. So he takes a second look and opens the books so that the angels can see that the decisions are correct. It reveals that he will blot out our sins forever. Isn't that a wonderful teaching? Jesus is going to blot out our sins from our hearts, from the records, from the angels' minds, and he says, I'm not going to remember them, remember them anymore. Would you like to go to heaven and know that your angel is fully aware of all the mistakes you made? That wouldn't be nice, would it? So he's going to blot out our sins forever. And it plots a definite date on God's timeline, the last day of prophecy, that is the last prophetic date, and tells us that he's coming soon. Those are all wonderful things. And Satan hates every one of them. And so he's launched an attack against this, uh, this teaching. Now, when uh, the people who were the pioneers of our faith uh, discovered this teaching, it made it easier to understand a lot of other Bible passages. Suddenly, what it said in Revelation 10 made a whole lot of sense. John was asked to take a little book and eat it. It was sweet in his mouth, but bitter in his stomach. Oh, they said, we understand what that means now. That was us going through the great disappointment. Malachi 3, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to the earth? No, to his temple. Suddenly that, that uh, made perfect sense to them. The first angel's message, the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made. Daniel 7, 13, Jesus is coming with the clouds of heaven to the earth? No, to the ancient of days as that judgment begins. And Revelation 3, the door that was shut and then another door that was opened, which we'll talk about today. All these texts began to, to uh, make good sense to them now that they understood what Jesus was doing. But Satan attacked this teaching right off the start. In fact, because it explained the misunderstanding of the believers who thought that Jesus was coming to the earth in October and he did not, and now uh, through the understanding that they had been given, they said, no, uh, we understand now that Jesus wasn't coming to the earth. He was beginning a new ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. But that was ridiculed. That was mocked. And one theologian sneered, that's the greatest face-saving device in ecclesiastical history. So this teaching was not appreciated from the very start. And uh, it's been opposed and criticized not only by those that are outside of our faith, but sometimes, unfortunately, even from those who once walked with us. Among them was, uh, of course, Dudley Canwright. About four or five times, he would leave the church and criticize it bitterly, and then he would come back and repent and be part of the Adventist faith and be one of the best proclaimers of the message. And then he'd be out, and then he'd be in. And it happened four or five times until finally he left for good. He was kind of the grandfather of the criticisms against Adventism, particularly the teaching of the investigative judgment. Uh, what we see now, more recent times, uh, Desmond Ford, Walter Ray, Dale Ratzliff, they're, they're basically recycling the uh, criticisms that Canwright brought years ago, which in a way is sort of an advantage because what Dudley Canwright uh, brought in his criticisms, there's been many, many able scholars who have researched out his criticisms and given uh, Bible answers to, to refute every single one of them. We have access to those now, but we recognize that uh, there are those who don't appreciate this wonderful, wonderful teaching. The point is that, as far as our study is concerned here, Jesus made a transition in his ministry in 1844. He moved from the holy place to the most holy place. This signaled an emphasis on the ministry of blotting out of sin 
preparing a people to stand when probation is closed, through the time of trouble, and be ready for his glorious appearing. There was a change that occurred, 1844. So, here's the key point. To follow the Lamb in this sense is to accept and appreciate his special atoning ministry that is being conducted now in the most holy place. It is to believe that he has the power to cleanse sin, not only from the records of heaven, but from the hearts of humans. That is what it means to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. That's the special understanding and ministry that this church has been given to share with the world. Now, we're going to put a number of quotations from a very, very wonderful book, Great Controversy, on the screen now. I'm going to read them without too much comment, but I'm going to highlight in the paragraphs we read this word follow, because that's what we're thinking about. Though these are those who follow the Lamb, and we're thinking of that particularly in the sense of those who followed Jesus as he moved from the holy place into the most holy place and began this last phase of his ministry. So we're going to read these quotes now. Those who followed in the light of the prophetic word saw that instead of coming to the earth at the termination of the 2300 days in 1844, Christ then entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to perform the closing work of atonement preparatory to his coming. After the disappointment of 1844, the people were not yet ready to meet their Lord. There was still a work of preparation to be accomplished for them. Light was to be given, directing their minds to the temple of God in heaven, and as they should by faith follow their high priest in his ministration there, new duties would be revealed. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of the penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, a putting away of sin among God's people upon the earth. This work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelation 14. When this work shall have been accomplished, the, the ones who follow the Lamb, the followers of Christ, will be ready for His appearing. It's pretty significant to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They, the believers after 1844, represented in the parable of the bridegroom, they were not, not to be present in person at the marriage, for it takes place in heaven while they are upon the earth. The followers of Jesus, those who have followed him in his ministry there, are to wait for the Lord when he, will re when he will return from the wedding. But they are to understand his work and to follow him by faith as he goes in before God. It is in this sense that they are said to go in to the marriage. Again, after 1844, it was seen the application of those words of Christ in Revelation addressed to the church at this very time. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David. He that openeth and no man shuts, shuts and no man opens. I know thy works. I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. We're going to talk about three different doors that uh, represent different epochs, different time periods. It is those who by faith follow Jesus in the great work of the atonement, who receive the benefits of his mediation in their behalf, while those who reject the light which brings to view this work of ministration are not benefited thereby. Sad words. If you don't follow the Lamb, you don't get the benefit of what he's doing. Now, in these next paragraphs, something very significant, so listen very carefully. We're thinking about three different doors, opening and closing. The Jews who rejected the light given at Christ's first advent and refused to believe on him as the Savior of the world could not receive pardon through him. When Jesus at his ascension entered by his own blood into the heavenly sanctuary to shed upon his disciples the blessings of his mediation, the Jews were left in total darkness to continue their useless sacrifices and offerings. The ministration of types and shadows had ceased. That door by which men had formerly found access to God, was no longer open. The Jews had refused to seek him in the only way whereby he could then be found, through, oops, how would I do? Through the ministration in the sanctuary in heaven. Therefore, they found no communion with God. To them, the door was shut. They had no knowledge of Christ as the true sacrifice and the only mediator before God. Hence, they could not receive the benefits of his mediation. She's making an illustration, an analogy here, between the Jews who rejected Jesus as he began a new ministry after the cross and to the churches that existed when the uh, prophecy of, of Daniel had been fulfilled. 
the condition of the unbelieving Jews illustrates the condition of the careless and unbelieving among professed Christians who are, here's an important word, willingly ignorant of the work of our merciful high priest. In the typical service, when the high priest entered the most holy place, all Israel were required to gather about the sanctuary and in the most solemn manner humble their souls or afflict their souls before God, that they might receive the pardon of their sins and not be cut off from the congregation. How much more essential is this anti-typical day of atonement in this day of atonement that we understand the work of our high priest and know what our duties are required of us, that we follow the lamb from the holy to the most holy place. So we see that Sister White refers to three separate doors indicating passage into areas of ministry in which Jesus served. Now, if we go back to the tabernacle, we see that there was a door, a gate at the entrance to the courtyard. There was a, another veil uh, hanging that uh, uh, set, entered into the holy place. And then, of course, inside <coughs> there was another veil that separated the holy from the most holy place. So we're going to think about those three different doors, those just different compartments. These areas of ministry represent three great epochs or segments of time. The Old Testament era, the New Testament era after the cross until 1844, and then the time period beginning in 1844. So if we go back to the picture of the temple, the first gate entered into the courtyard. And that represents Jesus' ministry from the time of Adam up until the cross. That is where the animals were brought that were sacrificed that typified or illustrated or were the shadows of his sacrifice. And so during that time period, those who entered into the courtyard there were benefited by his ministry. But here's what Sister White says. After Jesus died on the cross and went into the second compartment through that other veil, the ministration of types and shadows had ceased. That door by which men had formerly found access to God was no longer open. If you refuse to believe in Jesus as the divine Messiah, as the sacrifice, then uh, that, that ministry was closed and the door was shut and you could not gain the benefit of it. The New Testament era after the cross until 1844 is represented by the door to the holy place in which Jesus was seen in Revelation 1. What is he seen walking among in Revelation 1? The golden lampstands, right? He's in the holy place. Christians who received Christ as the true sacrifice and knew that he'd gone to heaven had followed him from the courtyard to the holy place in a figure of speech. But then that changed in 1844. The time period beginning in 1844, represented by the door into the most holy place, where the Ark of the Covenant was seen in Revelation 11:19, That's going to be quoted here shortly. So let's continue reading some paragraphs there that explain this. The passing of the time in 1844 was followed by a period of great trial to those who still held the Advent faith. Their only relief, so far as ascertaining their true position was concerned, was the light which directed their minds to the sanctuary above. Some renounced their faith in their former reckoning of the prophetic periods, and they ascribed to human or satanic agencies the powerful influence of the Holy Spirit, which had attended the Advent movement. Another class firmly held that the Lord had led them, they were following the Lamb, had led them in their past experience, and as they waited and watched and prayed to know the will of God, they saw that their great high priest had entered upon another work of ministration, and following him by faith, these are they who follow the Lamb wherever he goeth, following by faith, they were led to see also the closing work of the church. They had a clear understanding of the first and second angel's messages. They were prepared to receive and give to the world the solemn warning of the third angel of Revelation 14. Here's that quote from Revelation 11 now. The temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his, covenant, uh, ark of his testament. The ark of God's testament is in the Holy of Holies, the second apartment of the sanctuary. In the ministration of the earthly tabernacle, which served to the example and shadow of heavenly things, this apartment was opened only upon the great day of atonement for the cleansing of the sanctuary. Therefore, the announcement that the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his testament was seen points to the opening of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary in 1844 as Christ entered there to perform the closing work of the atonement. Those who by faith followed their great high priest as he entered upon his ministry in the most holy place 
beheld the Ark of His Testament. As they had studied the subject of the sanctuary, they had come to understand the Savior's change of ministration. They saw that He was now officiating before the Ark of God, pleading His blood in behalf of sinners. The Ark in the tabernacle on earth contained the two tables of stone upon which were inscribed the precepts of the law of God. The Ark was merely a receptacle for the tables of the law, and the presence of these divine precepts gave to it its value and sacredness. When the temple of God was opened, the Ark of His Testament was seen. Within the Holy of Holies and the sanctuary in heaven, the divine law is sacredly enshrined, the law that was spoken by God Himself amid the thunders of Sinai and written with His own finger on the tables of stone. In the very bosom of the Decalogue is the fourth commandment, as it was first proclaimed. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant or maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The Spirit of God impressed the hearts of those students of his word. The conviction was urged upon them that they had ignorantly transgressed this precept by disregarding the Creator's rest day. Now, as they saw themselves transgressors of the law, sorrow filled their hearts, and they manifested their loyalty to God by keeping His Sabbath holy. Many and earnest were the efforts made to overthrow their faith. Critics, none could fail to see that if the earthly sanctuary was a figure or pattern of the heavenly, the law deposited in the ark on earth was an exact transcript of the law in the ark of heaven, and that an acceptance of the truth concerning the heavenly sanctuary involved an acknowledgment of the claims of God's law and the obligation of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Here was the secret of the bitter and determined opposition to the harmonious exposition of the scriptures that revealed the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Men sought to close the door that God had opened and to open the door which he had closed. Christ had opened the door or ministration of the most holy place, and light was shining from that open door of the sanctuary in heaven, and the fourth commandment was shown to be included in the law, which is there enshrined, what God had established, and no man could overthrow. So what does it mean to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth? Well, of course, it means in a general way for people everywhere at all times to follow Jesus as our example. It means to walk in his footsteps, let him be our guide. And that pertains to whenever or wherever a person might live. But in a more specific way as pertaining to the people of, that live in the last days, it means more than that. It means to understand and accept the sanctuary message. It means to follow Christ by faith as he left the ministration in the holy place and entered that of the most holy place in 1844. It means to appreciate his objective to blot out, remove sin from our hearts so that we can live through the time of trouble and be ready to receive him when he comes. It means to honor the Sabbath, the fourth commandment of the Decalogue, which was deposited in the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy place of the sanctuary, the place of Christ's ministry now. The Sabbath, the memorial of creation, is an illustration of what Christ wants to do in our lives right now, to create in me a new heart. Just as he took something in darkness without form and void, but made it good, so he can create within us his image, a reflection of his character. That's what it means to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Now, it means also, of course, to understand the hour of his judgment has come and to worship him who made. That's the substance of the first angel's message. <clears throat> so three ways to follow the Lamb. Follow him as our example, aside following him into the most holy place as he blots out our sins. In what other way do the saints of the last generation follow the Lamb? That is what we'll discuss next week. If you want to raise your hand with me and say, Lord, I want that ministry in the most holy place to apply to me. I want you to cleanse and blot sin out of my life, not just to wipe the record clear, to wipe my heart clear of sin. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our closing song as we conclude our service. First and last. First and last. Let's stand together as we sing hymn number 469. We'll sing just the first and the last verse. First and last verses, 469.
worship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a joy divine, leaning on the to fear, leaning on the everlasting arms. I have the peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure. Father in heaven, we want to say thank you today that we can lean on you for our salvation. Amen. We pray for this experience to be real in our lives, that we won't be folk or fainty, phony Christians, but we'll be, we'll be real Christians in heart, Amen. that you can write in our hearts an inscription of Jesus' character of love. Amen. May that be accomplished within us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.